Welcome to the 32nd Annual Samuel and Althrea Strom Lectures in Jewish Studies. I'm Paul Burstein, Chair of the Jewish Studies Program and Prusan Professor of Jewish Studies here at the University of Washington. Uh, before we start, I we should really say something about the Strom Lectures. Uh, they have been supported by, since their inception, well, over 30 years ago at this point, by Samuel and Althea Strom, who had a vision of bringing to Seattle some of the most distinguished Jewish study scholars in the world who would speak to the public in language the public uh, can understand and who would also turn the lectures uh, subsequently into books. And we have a book series published by the University of Washington Press over these years. These lectures turn into award-winning books that are used in courses and read all over the world. Basically, what we have here thanks to the generosity of the Stroms, and Sam unfortunately passed away several years ago, but Althea is here, and I'm very, very glad to see her here. It's, it's a great honor to have her here and, uh, and to be up here. Um, this year's uh, lecture uh, the, uh, are called Creation, Revelation and Redemption, The Religion of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, presented by Professor Larry Schiffman of New York University. Now, I'm not going to uh, introduce our speaker. I'm going to turn that over to someone who has more expertise than I do, uh, Professor Scott Nagel. Uh, Scott first came here quite a number of years ago as a Cole Fellow. This is a, a postdoctoral fellowship endowed by Samuel and Althea Strom in memory of Althea's sister, Hazel D. Cole. Uh, he contributed greatly to the campus during the time he was here. He went away to another university for a few years. He came back. He's now a great member of our faculty. Many of you, I'm sure, know him. This last year, uh, he had a dual uh, honor. He was promoted to full professor, and he was appointed chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, which is really a credit not just to his administrative skills, but his, to, to his vision as to what that department could accomplish here at the University of Washington. He's an expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls himself. He's teaching a wildly oversubscribed course about the Dead Sea Scrolls this quarter. And so let me introduce Scott Nagel, who will say something about our speaker. Thank you, Paul. Hello, folks. I think we're in for a real treat tonight. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lawrence Schiffman. Dr. Schiffman is the Ethel and Irvin E. Edelman Professor in Hebrew and Judaic Studies and the Chairman of the Skirball Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies at New York University. Dr. Schiffman is a foremost authority on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Since completing his PhD at Brandeis University in 1974, he has authored more than 150 articles that cover the entire gamut of Qumran scholarship, from textual editions and treatments of particular scrolls to law, religion, interpretation, messianism, and even magic. His list of published articles illustrates both his incredible range and his interdisciplinary interests. He also has written and or edited at least 17 books, which include Who Was a Jew? Rabbinic and Halakhic Perspectives on the Jewish Christian Schism, published in 1985, From Text to Tradition, A History of Judaism in Second Temple and Rabbinic Times, appearing in 1989, and perhaps most famously, Reclaiming the Dead Sea Scrolls, published in 1994. He also has served as the co-editor-in-chief of the magisterial set of volumes entitled Oxford Encyclopedia of the Dead Sea Scrolls, appearing in the year 2000. It would not be an understatement to say that Dr. Schiffman's published works have altered the course of Dead Sea Scroll research. His book, Reclaiming the Dead Sea Scrolls, in particular, has forced a dramatic rethinking about the authorship of the scrolls and the nature of the Qumran community. His work has also raised questions with regard to the interpretive frameworks of the earliest scholars to study the scrolls. Indeed, indeed, his research has helped to make Qumran studies an entire field to itself. Recently, Dr. Schiffman has even ventured deep into the world of cyberspace. As he informs me, he is currently serving as the editor-in-chief of the Center for Online Judaic Studies. 
Dr. Schiffman's awards and honors are far too many to list here. Suffice it to say that he has received a number of visiting professors, professorships at Johns Hopkins University, the University of Toronto, Yale University, Duke University, Ben-Gurion University of the Negev, and even the Russian State University for the Humanities in Moscow. He also has been a fellow of the Annenberg Research Institute and the Institute for Advanced Studies of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. His service to the community of scholars has also been immense. Among other things, he is the Vice President of Publications for the Association for Jewish Studies and is a member of the Council of World Union of Jewish Studies. He also has served on the editorial board of a number of journals and monograph series. He currently sits on the board of directors for the Dead Sea Scroll Foundation. As you can tell, he is highly sought after as a scholar, as a lecturer, and as an advisor, and we are delighted that he is with us. Tonight's lecture promises, I believe, to be as fascinating as it is informative, as Dr. Schiffman will speak to us on the topic of God, humanity, and the universe in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lawrence Schiffman. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's really a great honor to be here. This is a well-known lecture series which has produced many, many very distinguished studies in our field. And I also have to say that we at NYU owe a particular thanks to Professor Nagel and his colleagues because two of his students went on to be doctoral students with us at NYU. And we hope that uh, we will merit similar excellent students in the future. So I guess we have a tie that no one realizes here. Now, in the introduction, there already was a hint of a kind of polemic that I have been maintaining for a long time, which basically states that the only way to properly understand the Dead Sea Scrolls is to understand them within the context of the history of Judaism. But furthermore, I want to advance that polemic in this series of lectures by pointing to the extent in which the scrolls, ideology, theology, and related beliefs all basically need to be set within the wider context of Jewish religious thought throughout the centuries. Now, despite that fact, we do have to remind everyone here at the beginning of these lectures, even though there is a beautiful exhibit in town, which I hope everybody will see, that the context of our discussion is Judea in the second and first centuries BCE, with a few scrolls copied, but probably not authored, in the first century CE. The Dead Sea sect had made its home in the area of Qumran, at the shore of the Dead Sea, and near there, there were these caves in which the scrolls were found. But furthermore, along this wadi, there was a center in which the scroll sectarians lived. Now, in this area, there had been hidden various scrolls. Now, the point that I want to make as we think about these caves, Cave 1, Cave 4, where something like about 600 fragmentary scrolls were found, Cave 11, where quite a number of complete scrolls were found, what you have to be aware of is that we are not talking about some representation of the Jewish mainstream. We're talking about a library of texts this library of text was used by a group of people that inhabited what we today generally call the settlement of Qumran, buildings which were used from either 120 or 120 BCE up through something like most probably 68 CE when the area was destroyed as part of the Jewish revolt against Rome. Now these people that went there brought with them a collection of texts which included the Hebrew Bible, as well as books that we call apocryphal or pseudepigraphal, books about the Bible or like the Bible, as well as sectarian works that indicated their own particular beliefs. Most of this series will be about those sectarian beliefs, about the specific ideas of this group. So our claim will not be, not, that this represents whatever mainstream Judaism might have been if it actually existed because that's a debate among scholars, the extent to which we can pinpoint one group as mainstream in an era in which Jews were arguing with one another about how to interpret Judaism. But rather, the real point here 
is to show that the beliefs of these people can be compared, contrasted, and understood in the context of the wider nature of Jewish thought at that time. Now, among the most important issues that had to be discussed by any Jewish group dealing with Jewish theology and thought would be the question of creation, the nature of God's creation of the universe and the relationship of God to man. Now this text, the creation paraphrase, basically paraphrases the biblical story of Genesis. In fact, it's typical of the Dead Sea Scrolls to have texts which basically retell and change the biblical story. We call those biblical paraphrases or rewritten Bible. When you read this text, you will see that virtually everything is the same as what we would have expected except that the text makes the point very clearly that in a certain sense, the action of man, and I guess this actually means man and woman, in eating of the tree constituted a revolt against God. This is very similar to a rabbinic idea that Adam and Eve were given one commandment and that they failed in observing that one commandment. And indeed, when we look at the Garden of Eden story in the scrolls, we will see that it's worked, it's understood in a similar way. You will get a chance to see in the museum, if you haven't seen it, a Genesis manuscript, which shows that this text, of course, as we would expect, like all the other biblical books, with the possible exception of Esther, was part of the biblical collection, what we call the canon of the Qumran sectarians. And here the Garden of Eden story is explained in several texts. Now, I had a funny experience. I was recently interviewed for a movie that's going to go on on cable TV about the Garden of Eden. And they came in and they started to ask me questions, and I started to discuss the Garden of Eden story as a kind of microcosm of the relationship between human beings, male and female, God and humanity, humans in the world, God in the world. And the guy said to me, I don't understand. Aren't you going to discuss whether human beings really started out in a Garden of Eden or not. And I tried to explain to him that the history of Jewish interpretation was not about that. It was about what we could learn about ourselves and how we ought to live from that story. Indeed, in these texts we find the centrality of that story, and we find this kind of sense that the Garden of Eden story provides such teachings. And when you look down to the bottom of this paraphrase here, you will see that on this text, we can see that there is a progression understood here of humanity from the kind of creation in the garden through the transgression in the garden through the violence that leads to the flood. Now here we enter into an area which is fundamental. Of course, on some level, the theology of the scrolls assumes that God is the creator of the universe and that God is the one who brought everything into being. This, of course, is the message of Genesis. But the fundamental question is to what extent and how we can account for evil within the context of a good God. What we will see is that the scrolls in general tend to assume that under God there is some kind of other agency, sometimes called Satan with a small s, usually called Belial, Belial in Hebrew, sometimes given other names, and that this instrument is responsible for evil and commands a group of humans as well as a group of angels. Now, that particular interpretation is one possible interpretation of the placement of evil into this world. Another one is the one that you see here, because the assumption here is that the shedding of innocent blood and evil doing takes place because of transgressions on the part of humanity, not because of some other force. It's perhaps more strongly close to the rabbinic idea of an evil inclination. We'll be coming back to this question a little bit later on in discussing the so-called two spirits that compete, according to the scrolls, for literally the soul of every person. But in any case, what you see here is a more classic idea, that the transgression of the garden leads to death and also leads to further transgression. A third point of view is in the Book of Enoch, because in the Enochic text, it is assumed that evil comes about because of fallen angels, beings that were supposed to be in heaven and decided instead to be interested in the daughters of men, eventually transgressed, and eventually led to a situation in which evil came about because of the deeds of these figures. 
One final Garden of Eden text. We have here a notion that somehow or another, the planting of the Garden of Evil was an attempt to reject evil and to provide an opportunity for humanity to know the difference between good and evil. Again, a kind of alternative perspective. And here I should pause to tell you that one of the problems about the scrolls, which maybe really isn't the problem, maybe it's sort of like the nature of Judaism and all of its uh, possibilities, is that we have varying points of view presented and everything doesn't agree. And here we have a notion that apparently the planting of the garden, the working of the garden by Adam and Eve was meant as a rejection of evil, as an acceptance of the divine goodness. But in the end, as we know, the Garden of Eden story ended the way it ended. Now one of the scrolls that's in the exhibit here, and is exceedingly significant, is a psalm scroll. Now this psalm scroll contains a hymn to the Creator. This hymn to the Creator will emphasize the kind of concept of the exalted God, a concept that we see in many other texts in the Dead Sea Corpus. Just look at these words, great and holy is the Lord, a holy of holies for generation after generation. As you keep reading, you may recognize some aspects here which sound like some of the prayers in today's Jewish prayer book. God is seen as the creator who created the world out of wisdom. I would say that this poem is a classic statement of the creation notion of Judaism, that God has created everything, that he is the one who is exalted, that he created the angels, humanity, the earth, and this is a very classic statement. Now a related text that we have to look at is known as the Hodayot. The Hodayot, also known as the Thanksgiving scroll, is not a scroll to be recited at the American holiday of Thanksgiving. Rather, it is a series of introspective poems that begin with the Hebrew words, I will give thanks, or something like it. This document emphasizes for us the notion of the power of God. Now, here we he see that God is the one who is the ruler over the angels, and remember that according to these texts, there are angels. The angels are seen as divided into two lots, the lot of good and the lot of evil. The angels of good are under some type of prince of lights or a figure named Michael, the archangel known from the book of Daniel. Or alternatively, they may be seen, the angels of good, as under God himself. But in fact, the angels of evil are under this fellow Satan with the small ass Belial, or as we also might call him, right, uh, the, the evil one. And these various terms that are used indicate this notion of dualism. And we're going to come back to this over and over in this talk, because we will see that there is a dualism of the human spirit, there is a dualism of humanity, dualism of angels, and a dualism which is built into the history of the world. But God is the ruler, and a key point is this notion, the line, without you nothing is done, and nothing can be known without your will. Here we have two very, very important notions. First of all, total divine control of everything. The scroll sect believed in a level of predestination and determinism, which is virtually complete. Now, there are some texts which may indicate that things are not quite that extreme, but nonetheless, they basically believe somehow or another that human beings have been predestined to act in a way of good or of evil. And then, that nothing can be known without your will. How is knowledge acquired by a human being? What is knowledge? To the belief of the sect of the scroll, all knowledge is a kind of gnosis, a kind of knowledge which is communicated by the divine to humanity. And there's no way to know anything any other way. Now you might think that a person endowed with the human intellect could take a book and start studying that book and like learn what's in it. It doesn't exactly work this way. This is a concept which is much closer to the medieval ideas of the active intellect. There's got to be some kind of connect with God in order to acquire any knowledge at all. Whether it's the knowledge, if you happen not to know where we are tonight, what the name of the room is, or whether it's really serious knowledge, say knowledge of the way the world works, knowledge of divine mysteries, whatever it is, you need to connect with God to, and to acquire any kind of knowledge. And of course, God is all powerful, and there is no one who can compare. Now this predestination is all over the scrolls. And the predestination is eventually going to lead to the judgment of the wicked and their destruction. 
This is his theme in the Thanksgiving hymns and in numerous other texts that exist in the scroll's corpus. Now, basically, all things, no matter what, are ascribed to God's power. And it is assumed that even before creation, as we see here, before they were established, he knew their deeds. He knew the years of their existence. Everything has been set forward for the years of eternity. Now, this concept does pose something of a problem within the context of the history of Judaism. In general terms, Talmudic Judaism has the famous statement that basically there is free will, but God knows in advance what will happen. This statement in the Ethics of the Fathers has caused tremendous debate. How can we explain such a thing? Often people put it like this. They say it's like a movie. If you're watching a movie being projected, the end of the movie has been predetermined, but you don't yet know what it is. And the difference is that the person who made the movie, he knows. So God knows the end of the movie even while we make choices. An alternative way to look at it is that we are in time and God is beyond time. So for us, each choice is made before or after the other. For God, the choices are all predetermined from the point of view, not that he determines them, but that he knows what we are going to do. It doesn't seem that these softer varieties fit these texts. So we should recall that Josephus, in telling us the story of the Jewish sectarian groups that existed immediately after the Maccabean War, speaking about the period in about 152 BCE, which is really right before the heyday of the scroll sect, and I have argued that this is about the time when the sect came into being. Some don't agree with me, but we'll assume for a moment that they're wrong. And, <laughs> and very much at that time, Josephus proceeds to tell us what are the Jewish groups at the time. So he tells us about the Pharisees, who believe basically that humans have free will, although God can interfere. That's the sort of classical Judaism. They're the forerunners of the rabbis, according to most views. He tells us about the Sadducees, who he identifies as having basically an Epicurean view, that God doesn't control everything, anything, I should say. And then he tells us about the Essenes, who most scholars do identify with the Dead Sea sect, a matter that I've raised some questions about, but it's not really relevant to our lectures here in this series. But in any case, he tells us about the Essenes, that they believe that everything is decided by God, that everything is predetermined. And certainly, this appears to be an ideology very similar to that of the sectarians. And the question is, how extreme should we believe they were in this concept? Now, there are some texts that talk about human beings as having certain numbers or percentages, and actually it's based on sixths, of light and darkness. These are fragmentary texts which seem to indicate that it may be that it's understood that people are not all bad or all good. In which case, maybe, it's not so predetermined. But you read text after text after text, which seems to indicate that the entire life of human beings has been determined. Now, the big question about all this, when we reach the so-called rule of the community or manual of discipline, there we have an entire text spelling this out, and the big question is, how can you square this with the idea of divine punishment? Because the question you have to ask is, if God the creator and the source of all knowledge, if we may paraphrase the Constitution, endowed us all with no choice, then how could anybody be punished as a transgressor? Now, the predestination is emphasized in this rule of the community text. And God, as it's noted right here, is a God of knowledge. And it's he, as a God of knowledge, who causes everything that happens. Why is this? Because you can't run the whole world in a predestined manner unless you have that complete knowledge. Now, the assumption is that there's a plan and everybody's going to do everything. And as it says here, they'll fulfill their function with no change. Now, if this is all the case, then again, how can we understand it? But it goes way beyond the question of human beings, because the same assumption is made about the universe. You stretch forth the heavens for your glory and all which is in them. You predestined according to your will. So it means here that the bodies of the universe have been set in motion by God. And here I would have to say this is, we could jokingly say, dangerously close to Maimonides, who basically states that God is the Aristotelian prime mover who has set the world into motion, and once he does that, it's just going to keep moving because the spheres spin each other the way, the way gears work. And why did I say dangerously? Because it's astounding 
that a text written in the second or first century BCE should have a concept which appears to be so much in agreement with a medieval, great Jewish medieval philosopher. But I can explain this in a lot of cases as resulting from the fact that often the very same issues were posed in antiquity that continue to be posed throughout the history of Judaism, indeed, in some cases, even until our own days. And so what is the thing that God predestined in this text, in the Thanksgiving hymn that we're looking at here? It is the notion that the luminaries are going to go, as it says here, according to their mysteries. Their mysteries here means their predesignated orbits and the stars in their orbits. And the winds and the meteors and the lightning, all these things have been set up in advance by God, and they don't happen by accident. They are part of the same process. So the entire process of creation and the conduct of this world are essentially one, it's predestined, it's dualistic, and God is the author of everything and the source of all knowledge. Now, it's not only as regards to those creations that have been set into motion what we would call nature. It's also true regarding what happens in, you might call it, the religious life of each Jew and the Jews as a people. Because we see that the God of history operates according to the same assumption. Now, when you say in Judaism that God is the God of history, it usually is taken to mean that God in some way, which we don't always have an understanding of, through the manner in which he rules the world, causes a certain direction in history to happen. But here again, it's much more direct, because of their transgression means the transgression of the Jews. This text that Sadakite fragments is a very important text. It's one that was found in the Cairo Geniza, in medieval manuscripts, even before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And it actually initiated a whole debate about the nature of the Dead Sea sect before we knew the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that debate took place in the early 20th century. But this takes the search that because of the transgression of Israel, who abandoned God, God hid his face from Israel in his temple and handed them over to the sword, meaning that the destruction, whenever it happened to the Jews, and in the case of this text, it's speaking about the Babylonian destruction of Judea and of the temple in 586 BCE, that this took place specifically at God's hands. And furthermore, whenever God takes such actions, he's righteous, and everything that he does is right, and as the Thanksgiving hymns point out, eventually he will destroy all iniquity, obviously in what we would term the end of days. Now, so here again, the process continues from creation through this predestination on the human level, the dualism of the human level, the angelic level, and within the soul of each person, the eventual destruction of evildoers, but yet God is seen as in control of everything. Now, this Hodayot Thanksgiving psalm tells us even more. For example, it tells us a point of view that appears at first glance to be totally at odds with everything I just told you. What do you mean that you can repent and that God's abundant mercies are there? As the statement of the text in Thanksgiving hymns, you will grant atonement for transgression to purify mankind from guilt in your righteousness. What is going on here? Well, I don't want to claim that I have a complete answer to this question. I have to tell you truthfully that this is a matter I've discussed with people in philosophy of religion. How can you possibly maintain simultaneously that everything is predestined, that human beings, however, can repent, they can escape punishment, they can be given reward? How can you understand all this in light of an assumption that everything is predetermined and that we have no moral choice? Well, there are a few answers. One possibility is that God has also premeditated or predetermined our repentance. That is to say, it's already been decided. So the person here who's chosen to become a member of the group is saying to God, listen, I know you've also predestined me to repent. Okay. The second possibility is that what to us is a contradiction is simply not a contradiction to them that they can't solve a problem that exists in every single aspect of Judaism. After all, how many times do we hear somebody say, perhaps at a funeral, that, well, there's nothing we can do, everything is decided by God. And yet such a view is against the basic principles of Judaism, which believe in free will. Furthermore, if you take a look at Pauline Christianity, you will see that here or there, 
There are tendencies towards ideas of complete predestination or close to it. And you ask yourself, how could this idea have entered into Christianity when the whole message of Jesus assumes human free will and moral decision making? How could this be? So let me now give you the cynical answer. The cynical answer is, it's simple. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. God has predestined people to be good or evil. Who's been predestined to be good? Whoever joins our group. Whoever doesn't join our group has been predestined to do evil. Our group members repent, and everyone else doesn't. Therefore, we will survive in the end of days, and they will be destroyed. Well, while that is a cynical answer, it may be the right answer. Let me explain why. Because the sectarians somehow or another seem essentially to believe that the main act of indication that you're on the side of good instead of the side of evil is that you join the group. Because the purpose of the group, what we generally call the Qumran sect, which has various rules of admittance and various regulations for how to live, is essentially to create a state of perfect holiness and perfect observance of Judaism. And therefore, if you make the step to join that group, you have essentially crossed the line to be a member of that group. And anyone who has not joined that group is the outsider, the evildoer. Here, by the way, is a fundamental difference both with Phariseeism and with early Christianity. Both Phariseeism and early Christianity both preach love of your neighbor. It happens to be a quotation from the Hebrew Bible, so we should expect that. And these texts preach hatred of those outside the group. Because those outside of the group have somehow basically indicated their lack of desire to join in the group of the good. So the self-fulfilling prophecy idea is not so crazy after all, because whether you decide to join or not join indicates, in the view of these sectarians, an essential decision about which camp you want to be in, the camp of light or the camp of darkness. Now then there's another idea that goes along with this. Once a person joins the group, the person is going to be vindicated. Now, vindication, as you see in this text from the rule of the community, is often translated not as, vindica as vindication, but as justification. Now, I don't like this translation because I think it's fundamentally different than the Pauline doctrine of justification. Because the vindication here is vindication that comes because a person has agreed to observe the law. And through observing the law, this person, in observing it the way the sectarians say you should observe it, which is going to be the subject of our second lecture, this means that you, as a result, receive the reward that is called here vindication. Whereas justification seems to be something somewhat different in Pauline doctrine, and I think that we can't completely uh, smooth that over. Nonetheless, we find out in this text that God is completely righteous, that he's good, that he grants atonement, that he purifies human beings from all transgressions, right? And this, of course, is typical Judaism appearing here because we better remember that most of what these people believe and do in their Jewish practice is going to be common with other Jews despite all the disagreements that they have. And accordingly, in this text, we find that because of this, the God is the agent to whom one gives thanks. Now, we've already hinted at this idea several times of this dualism within human beings. Let's take a look carefully at a text from the rule of the community that makes the point that this dualism is a really serious business. He created mankind for dominion over the earth, etc., and set over him two spirits so that he, man, could follow them until the time of his visitation. These are the spirits of truth and iniquity. And then, for the light comes the origins of truth, and darkness are the origins of iniquity. There's a prince of lights who rules over, but the hand of the angel of darkness in his hand is rule over all the people of iniquity. Now, this kind of dualism is very complex. And let's, for a moment, make a comparison with the rabbinic idea of, this, of the evil inclination and the good inclination. The assumption of the evil inclination and the good inclination within a human being is that every human being has to make a decision of what he or she is going to do and be. And we have the free will to make that decision. It's just that there are two competing arguments going on within us. You know, I can sleep late, or I can get up and do what I should do. I can keep quiet and get some money I don't deserve, or I can open my mouth and give it back. Now, we can all see the different 
inclinations one way or another. Sometimes the inclinations become too difficult, and sometimes they're much more serious. And we can all think of our own examples of where the issues are more serious than what I just gave you. Now, in that point of view, there's the human being, the human being's soul, and a notion that somehow or another God has given commandments and the people are supposed to follow them. Here it's a little different. Here there's an assumption that, first of all, the dualism extends to heavenly beings. God has set up two heads for the good and the evil. And it's these two heads that are competing to overpower you, not from inside, but from outside. Because they're not in you, they're outside forces in the world. In this respect, it's a little bit more like Satan with a capital S. Because the concept of Satan as a capital, with a capital S, as it enters into early Christianity, is that evil isn't because I failed in myself to do what I should have done. And maybe evil's too strong a word. Maybe use a word doing not so much the right thing, but a little bit more something isn't right, because most of us don't do really evil deeds. We just don't do the right thing. And what's going on here is that you have an assumption similar to that Satan idea that it comes from outside. So I want you to understand that in this particular respect, the dualism is pretty extreme. And it's projected onto heavenly figures that compete to get us to do what we should do what we shouldn't do. And don't ask me what about predestination, but the bottom line is that everybody's predestined to belong to one of these groups. Because, as the text also said, God placed them side by side to compete with one another until the final age, and they are going to hate each other forever. The forces of good and evil. Now, these groups have a special term. The term is lots. And these lots, every person is in a lot. You're in a lot of good and a lot of evil. And the angels are in lots, good and evil. And this is a rather, again, very extreme concept of dualism. Now, I have to again say, I mentioned this before, there are a few texts which indicate that a human being is not all good and all evil. But nonetheless, it seems that a human being is placed in one of the two lots and is predestined to be a follower of one side of the other. Now, as a result of this, or perhaps closely related to it, is another point of view, and it's especially a point of view which seems to merge with certain ideas that we find in the Pauline corpus much more than in early Jewish texts. And that is the notion of the lowliness of human beings. Now, the human being here you've got in the Thanksgiving hymn, someone is speaking, it's either speaking in the name of the community or the teacher of righteousness or the leader of the community. He speaks about having been taken from dust and formed of clay, a fount of impurity. Basically what this is saying is where does a human being really come from? Human being really comes from, if I may quote, the ethics of the father says it a little differently. He doesn't speak about the female side, he speaks about the male side. He says the human being comes from a fetid drop. Well, the question is how far do you go with this idea? Uh, here we find the human being comes as a source of dust and kneaded with water, a place of guilt and a dwelling of darkness. He's referring to the female anatomy. And then in the end, what's going to happen to a human being? It's going to die. The original human being comes from God mixing dust right, and uh, together, and then the humans that follow come from the female anatomy, and then eventually humans are going to die again. And so as he says in this text here, what is flesh that it should understand your mysteries? How can I understand anything about you? A creature of dust that should be able to guide its steps, how can I direct myself if I'm so lowly? Here we find a lowliness which is way, way beyond what you find in Talmudic Judaism, it's similar to certain concepts that we find in Pauline ideas, and it comes up again in medieval Judaism in the Ashkenazic pietists, and doesn't have much of a life in Judaism. Now, somebody will react to me looking at this quotation and say, what are you talking about? It's almost verbatim in the High Holy Day prayer book. The human being has its origins in dust, and he's going to come from dust, and he's going to go to dust. And therefore, what can I say? Because the human being is like a, in fact, there's even special melody for this in the synagogue to emphasize it. So you say to me, what are you talking about? So let me explain. The issue here is degree and consistency. Classical Judaism always believed that there are times when a human being should look on his or her lowliness and see that in, in its truth. But there are times when the human being can't live without a sense of self-esteem. These texts seem to focus over and over on the lowliness. 
And it's a kind of asceticism of the mind, you might say. Seeing yourself as a lowly being. And it's something which is not mainstream, although it finds a small place within Judaism. It's like speaking about asceticism. Yes, Jews are commanded to fast on the Day of Atonement, because it's believed if you fast for 24 hours, you'll get something. Yes, the rabbis made fast to symbolize certain destructions that took place to the Jewish people. But do you really believe that the human being, through suffering as its main purpose, would attain its relationship with God? To this, Judaism said no. So it's very often a question of degree. And what we're looking at here is an emphasis which is much greater than in other Jewish sources. And again, we see that this is in all kinds of texts. A person can't achieve perfection at all. It's impossible. But yet, somehow or another, there's a fundamental assumption that human beings can repent. But as you notice in this text from the rule of the community, the form of repentance is through following God's laws. Because ultimately, according to the sectarians, and we'll be speaking more about Jewish law in the second lecture, it is the following of God's law that is what makes a human being perfect. That law includes numerous aspects of purification, ritual purification. So only by following the law of God will the flesh be purified. It means not literally in terms of the specific purification laws, but it means that the human being, the physicality of the human being, is elevated to spirituality when that human being follows the laws. This, I think, it shares fundamentally with classical Judaism. Furthermore, this text emphasizes something very important. It says that through the spirit of holiness of the community of truth, it means the sectarian group, can a person be purified. Meaning that the holiness, according to the sectarians of Qumran, which will purify a person, is only available inside the group. Only in this group can a person attain the purity and perfection which is required. Now, total predestination, for those who doubted it, is repeated here, but the point that I want to emphasize is that it has a chronology. One sees in this text that evildoers are going to rule for periods of wrath. And these periods of wrath, we know from other texts, have been specifically measured out. And we'll see them later on when we get to the war scroll, which describes the war between good and evil. That we'll be discussing primarily in the third lecture, when we discuss the end of days. But in any case, what is clear is that this day of slaughter described here, which is the end of days in which the evildoers will be destroyed, is a period which has been set out from the beginning as well. Now I have to tell you, this here flies in the face of what we know of as classical Judaism and Christianity. Because if I may quote the prophet Ezekiel, I, he's speaking in the name of God, do not desire the death of the sinner, but rather that he should return. Nonetheless, the sectarians of Qumran expected that all of their enemies would be completely destroyed in some great slaughter in the end of days. In other words, the dualism in their assumption meant that everybody could not repent. Whereas if you look at any other text, Jewish and Christian text, they all share the assumption that in the end of days, people would be able to repent. Now, there's a little problem to what I just said. And that is that if you go back to the Hebrew Bible, you'll notice there's something called the Day of the Lord. And there is this idea that in the end of days, there will be enemies that have to be defeated. But these enemies that have to be defeated are some specific enemies. And these ideas are carried on in medieval Judaism, not only in a variety of apocalyptic texts, but they're also carried on even in the philosopher Maimonides' legal code. But there the assumption is that there are certain specific enemies that have to be defeated. Not that everybody in the world but me and my group are going to die in this end of days. And that dualism in these texts extends that far. Now, I also want for a moment to point out that such apocalyptic ideas do exist in certain modern strains of Christianity. It's hard to argue that they exist classically in Christianity. But if you look at some of your bestseller lists today, you will find that numerous books about the complete doomsday destruction of everybody, but some group of the elect, have begun to be popular. So this is not a completely strange concept. Now, ironically, with all of the things that we've seen of this dualism, 
There is an assumption that one of the most important things that a person can do is to become close to God and to know God. And there's an assumption that this knowledge of God takes place because the human being is endowed with God's Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit in these texts often refers to the spirit of prophecy. But often it is some kind of almost what the philosophers call the active intellect, which makes it possible to understand God. This Holy Spirit is not hypostasized like the Holy Ghost in the New Testament. It is simply some kind of inspiration. And indeed, that's the way it's used by the rabbis in describing the spirit of prophecy and in describing the origins of some of the biblical books. Now, one of the things that we know is that the texts of Enoch emphasize the notion of God as being exalted above everything. And here I'm taking a little bit of a turn. What I've been showing you so far is the standard view of the sectarian. Along with this, there are a few texts which have a more mystical way of looking at things, such as the Aramaic Enoch, which I believe is, in fact, on exhibit here. And here you have a variety of views in which the person reading the text, and certainly the author, is transported to a vision of the divine throne. Now, visions of the divine throne, based on Ezekiel and Daniel, are part and parcel of all early Judaism. They later on play a major role in Kabbalah. Now, when you look at a text which is called the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifices, you actually see detailed descriptions which are adapted from the descriptions of Ezekiel. The cherubim are the angels uttering blessing before God, and they're blessing the chariot throne, which in the third line here becomes essentially a hypostasis of God. And what happens here is that we see in the Qumran text the beginnings of certain concepts that don't necessarily fit together with what I have described to you so far, but which do provide the origins of some of what we understand as later Jewish mysticism, or perhaps not the origins, but the earliest evidence that we have for this in the post-Hebrew Bible period. And so these texts in which there were hymns, there are actually hymns, one to be recited on each of 13 Sabbaths, and some scholars believe that this text was meant to be used four times per year using a solar calendar such as the sectarians used. Another matter we'll have a chance to come back to discuss is there's also a calendrical tablet which happens to be the cover of my book, Reclaiming the Dead Sea Scrolls, that is on exhibit right here uh, in Seattle. In any case, it appears that along with everything I've discussed with you so far about this dualistic approach and how it sort of runs down the whole gamut, we have also the ideas of early Jewish mysticism, the notion that a human being could somehow bridge the gap and somehow get closer to God than would normally be the case. And so we have these descriptions of God's chariot, which are so full of the language of Ezekiel, but at the bottom of this text you can see that the great, great one sat on his throne, his garment was shining more than the sun and whiter than the great snow. This is based on Ezekiel and Daniel. And what happens apparently in this text is that the member of the group is somehow vouchsafed an opportunity to somehow see the image of God. Now the big question that we have to ask about this is, is this material congruent with what I've described to you so far? I first described to you in the earlier part of the lecture what is essentially the standard theology and ideology of the Qumran text. What comes after it is this stuff that I'm giving you after it meeting in my lecture, this stuff that I'm giving you to show you that we have other texts here which basically set out an early form of Jewish mysticism. And what we don't know totally is how these things fit together. But I always say in discussing the scrolls that they don't always agree with one another. And very often what we have is a situation in which, as you'd expect, various ideas coexist. So along with this kind of mainstream dualist predestination theology, there is apparently an idea that besides knowing God because he vouchsafes that knowledge to you, you can also know God through some kind of a mystical experience. Now the names for the groups of humans that exist are the sons of light and the sons of darkness. And as we find in the rule of the community, 
It is the job of the sons of light to illumine the heart of mankind, straighten before God all the ways of true righteousness. And God is then going to give them all of these things, the humble spirit and patience, great love and eternal good, wisdom, all of these things come to them because they are part of the sons of light. However, the opposite, as we see, will be given to the sons of darkness. Every one of them will be given the kind of eternal punishment. Now, what does all this add up to? First of all, one of the questions that always go off in people's minds is, well, wait a minute, maybe these people are all crazy, and why should we want to know about them? <laughs> I want to return to an emphasis that I tried to set forth in the beginning of this talk, which is that we are not talking about what must have been the view of the average Jew running around in 2nd and 1st centuries BCE. I think when you present things the way I presented them, you will immediately doubt some of the facile and silly statements made about claims of closeness to Christianity. There is absolutely no question that these documents in various ways explain things about later Christianity, as they do about later Judaism. But there is not, as the expression goes, a Chinaman's chance that these materials are the origins of Christianity. Because look at this theology in which there is total predestination, and I know that the Calvinists follow this point of view, but there's, this is simply not in accord with the New Testament as it's not in accord with rabbinic Judaism. What you see is a group of people who have become radicalized. They apparently started out as a group of priests. They ended up becoming radicalized in a whole variety of ways. This radicalization led them to a completely dualistic view of the world around them, both on the human level and on the cosmic level. Within myself, I no longer have a struggle between good and evil. There's a struggle outside me as to whether I'll be good and evil. And therefore, I and the next guy are divided. We're in one group or the other group. And then that cosmic struggle is going on among the angels. But it's not just a cosmic struggle. It's one that God has already predestined. And can I repent? We saw you can, but apparently only if you've been predestined to do so. And of course, the sign is if you do. But the bottom line here is that you're looking at an ideology which I think has its basis in a kind of complex of persecution and rejection by a group whose ideology and politics did not make it as the mainstream. Now you may say, so then why do we care about these people? I actually was asked by a student once, he said, I got up in the middle of the night one night and said, why am I actually studying these crazy Dead Sea Scrolls? I mean, these people sound like they're somewhat strange. Well, first of all, this group gathered into its library the earliest Bible manuscripts, and numerous other texts of interest. But the fact of the matter is that often what we learn about when we study certain things in the scrolls is ideas that are rejected by Judaism, have been rejected by Christianity. And we can learn where these ideas were not accepted and why. In the case of the extreme dualism that we saw here in understanding how God relates to humanity, in the case of the extreme predestination we saw here, we can see why these ideas seem to be some kind of a turnoff from the path of the Hebrew Scriptures, and they don't seem to be a logical conclusion from the message of the prophets. And yet it's fascinating to see that in the scrolls, every word and every idea is stated in the language of the Hebrew Bible as if it is a natural continuation of Hebrew biblical ideas. And yet, I think most of us will see that the ethical and moral results of such an approach, the exclusion of others, the assumption that others are either all good or all evil, the assumption that we all know everything that's right and no one else knows anything else that's right, the simplicity which is implied in these points of view, I think we can all see very simply why they did not become mainstream ideas in Judaism and Christianity. Thank you very much. I got it. Was fun. Questions. If anyone has questions, you should go to the microphone. Professor, this idea of dualism and predestination in the Middle East is also found in Zoroastrianism. Okay, so here's the problem about whether it relates to the gentleman asked whether it relates to Zoroastrianism. 
Now, it's really an interesting point. There were a whole lot of scholars of the scrolls who tried to prove that these ideas would relate to Zoroastrianism. And there are good reasons to feel that way. Now, there are two problems. The first problem is that Zoroastrianism, as we have it, the documents seem to be later than the Dead Sea Scrolls. So you have to make a fundamental assumption that these, early, that these, these later documents really do speak about the earlier phenomenon. And in fact, many scholars do believe that, so you would be on safe grounds if you want to do that. But then the problem is this, that it seems when you get into the details, beyond the obvious notions of the division of the world into good and evil, the details don't seem to work. And I think the reason for that is, here the whole thing is expressed through biblical notions and biblical ideology. So you're left with an unknown. Can we trace it in that way or can we not? And there were several conferences on this and some books written on it. And they simply leave you undecided as to whether or not you can make such a statement or not. Other questions? Okay. Thank you.